Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for this privilege once again. Thank you, Lord, for the kind of heart you've given us. A receptive heart, a broken heart, a broken spirit. Lord, we pray your word will sink down deep into every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. That will behold the beauty of the Lord and the glory of the Lord in your word even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray as we're ministering to us through all your ministers. We just pray that we'll never remain the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Be glorified in our lives, in our ministry. Amen. Let the work and the worship of our hands be acceptable to your Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, open our eyes to behold wonders, great things out of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 3. As we look at Nehemiah chapter 3, we appear challenged. The reason is, Bible students and various Christians skip chapter 3 of Nehemiah. And the reason is very clear. You have a lot of names there. And they're Hebrew names and Jewish names. They're not English names that you're familiar with. So, what's the use of that? Many people say. Not only that, you have the word built, builded, built all over. This one built, this one built, that one built. Not only that, you have, they just repaired. This other one came and repaired. That other one came and repaired. And this one fortified the city. And so, apart from build, build, buildage, repaired, restored, fortified, and those names there, what else? But we're not going to skip chapter 3. We're going to look at chapter 3 because there's a lot here. To start with, I pointed out to you now that the word build in various forms comes up a lot of times. Number two, the word repair in the various forms also appears a lot of times. And we need to understand that we too, we are builders. But first of all, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Stop there for a moment. All scripture. And chapter 3 of Nehemiah is part of all scripture. And because chapter 3 of Nehemiah is given by the inspiration of God, it is profitable. Profitable for what? Number one, profitable for doctrine. There's much teaching here. Number two, it's profitable for reproof. That is to correct ourselves and to reprove us. Number three, it's profitable for correction, but for profitable for instruction in righteousness. Now look at verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, complete. Then it says, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You're going to find out that Nehemiah did good work. And all those that joined hands with him, they did a lot of good works in Judah and Jerusalem. And to learn from them, because we want to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's why we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 3. Not only that, we find out that in Nehemiah chapter 3, they repaired the gates. They restored the gates. The great gates were broken down. And because the gates were broken down, they needed to come together and build and repair and restore those gates. Not only that, they repaired the walls and built the walls. In our own case, what gates are we building? Because if they built the gates, and we are learning from them that they built the gates, there must be some gates we need to build, we need to repair, we need to restore. Look at Genesis chapter 28 verse 17. Genesis Chapter 28, 
And we're reading from verse 17. That shows you then the importance of studying chapter 3 of Nehemiah. Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. Here is Jacob, and he says, And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. As we learned that they look at the gates that were broken down. And what's the gate for? The gate is for you to be able to enter into the city. There's a city you want to enter to. That's New Jerusalem. That's heaven. And it's a gate that we need to go through. And it's the gate of heaven. As you look at various churches in our land. And you look at various branches, even of our own church and denomination. You might discover that the gate through which we pass into the kingdom of God the gate might be cluttered. The gate might be kind of closed. The gate might be destroyed. There's a gate of repentance through which we get into the kingdom. The gate of righteousness through which we get into the kingdom. The gate of holiness through which we get into the kingdom. And as we look at the gate, the gate of heaven that leads us into the house of God. How is it today? That's the reason we're studying this so that we start to rebuild and repair and restore this gate of heaven we're looking at the word of god in psalm 118 psalm 108 we're looking at the gates because if you understand that they repair the gates they restore the gate they rebuild the gates and then we have gates so we need to repair and rebuild and restore you know why we're studying nehemiah chapter 3 psalm 118 i'm reading from verse 19 verse 20 in verse 19 it says open to me the gates of righteousness open to me the gates of righteousness as we look at our land and the churches are multiplying the fellowships are multiplying the ministries are multiplying and they do not know and, and you see all the posters and say the kind of things that they say they are opening up they are opening up uh, the gate of prosperity they are opening up the gate of deliverance they're opening up they say come in come and we're going to show you how to have, have your deliverance how to have your healing how to have this and that and i'm yet to see the poster that shows us how to enter through the gates of righteousness into the holy city and here it says open unto me and that's what you should be telling your pastors and your leaders open to us the gates of righteousness and i will go in into them and it says and i will praise the lord the praises of the lord will be in our mouth because the gate of righteousness is open that's why we'll come to this chapter 3 to repair rebuild and restore the gates of righteousness look at verse 20 it says the gate of the lord into which the righteous shall enter there's a gate of the lord and because of the gate of the Lord, we need to enter. That's the reason we're coming to this chapter. Jeremiah, I'm reading chapter 7, verse 2. Jeremiah, chapter 7. We're looking at verse 2 here. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. And proclaim there this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord. All ye of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. There is the gate of the Lord's house. The gate of the Lord. Come back, come physical now. Come natural. Look at you look at your own church. Do people even see the symbol that leads to the church? Where salvation is proclaimed, where righteousness is established, and where holiness is demonstrated. Yes, once we get in, we say wonderful. I didn't know that there was anything like this before. See the word of God flowing out. See the worship of the Lord flowing out. And see the revelation of the word of God that makes us to know this is how to get to the Lord. But the gate of that Lord's house and the signboard there, how is it? It's broken down. And nobody thinks about that. And there are people that come into the city. They, they are not in that community, your community. They do not know there's a deeper life church there. They do not understand that gate there. There's no signboard. And you want to find out yourself, how do we get into this church? If you were a new person in that community, how do you know the church is there? How do you find out? 
I'm going to get in there. That's the reason why we need to look at the physical church. We need to look at the mystical body. That is the body of Christ. And then the church, physical, the church, spiritual. And show us the gate that leads into that place. I'm looking at Psalm 87. Psalm 87, we're looking at verse 2. Psalm 87. And we're reading here from verse 2. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. That is Zion where the law of God is given out, where the word of God is rolled out, where the teaching of the word of God is given out. The Lord loves that gate. And we need to take care of that gate. Repair, rebuild, and restore. Now we're coming to the wall. We're building the walls. And when it says we're building the walls, the reason why we're studying all this is that if there's something for you to build, then you see a pattern, you see a model, you see an example, and you see an illustration on how to build. The question then is, what have I got to build? Number one, you need to build your personal life, your Christian life. We're looking at Jude. We're looking at Jude, verse 20. It says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves, building up yourself. And if you see other people who are built, then you want to say, I need to build myself, building up my faith, building my love, building my commitment, building the qualities of the Christian life in my life. It says, Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost, not only that you need to build your family. If you are married, if you are not married, you'll soon get married. Ah, they're going to sleep. I said, if you are not married yet, you'll soon get married. And when you get married, you need to build that family. You know, I, I know many people that think that we don't have to, you know, build our families. You know, we just, I, I knew the will of God. I discovered the will of God. And since it is the will of God, now where am I? I don't have anything to do at all in building that family. I just wake up in the morning, the family is still there. And then sleep at night, and then the family is still there. But well, then the family is collapsing because nobody is doing anything to build. And he must say, come and I'll show you how to build your family too. We're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. Proverbs 14 verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Doesn't even need the help of Satan to pull down her family. Doesn't need the help of a poster, somebody to Tobiah to pull down the family. She herself pulls down the family with her own tongue, with her own attitude, with the nagging and the complaints. And with the hands, she pulls everything about a wise woman. Every wise woman builds up her house. And because we have something to build, number one, your personal life, number two, your family, number three, we need to build the ministry and the work of the Lord. The ministry and the work of the Lord. And that's the reason we're coming together to look at this. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. A ministry to build, a church to build, the work of the Lord to build. And I pray that this mercy and work will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Laborers together. Laborers were laboring. We're building. We're raising up something. It says, we ye are God's husbandry and ye are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For all that foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man Build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, every man's ministry, every man's service, every man attempt to build of what sort it is. If you don't build up your personal life, everything will crumble when the time of testing comes, when persecution comes. Then the family, if you don't build up the family, challenges will come. Slander will come. Opposition will come. 
things will come from different directions against that family. If you're not building up the love, the loyalty, the faithfulness, the commitment, and the, the covenant in that family, something will happen. And then the church, the ministry, the work of the Lord. If you're not building up that work of the Lord, something will happen. And then you just find everything is disintegrating. I pray that this work will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. And then you're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Because we have the character, Christian character. Christian commitment, Christian behavior, attitude to build up as well. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 32. Acts 20, 32. It says, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the work, to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. That's your character. The fruit of the Spirit, the love and the joy and the peace and the long suffering and the meekness and the same temperance, the self control, building you up, maturing, growing, growing up. It says, Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified, sanctified by faith and sanctified by the grace of God. I want you to also build up the work of the Lord. We're looking at Romans chapter 15, verse 20. Romans chapter 15, verse 20. And, and you know there are people that do not, they don't understand there's any building. They just, you know, even those who are workers, those who are ministers and preachers, we just go to church on Sunday. And as we go to church on what's the goal? What's the pattern? What is the drawing? What is the sketch? What is the master plan? That we are building towards that plan. Your personal life. Where is the master plan? Your personal life. Where is the model? Where is the goal? What are you building towards? You ask a person that became a Christian at the age of 29. And now you are 60. 30, you know, 21 years after. And we are asking you 31 years after. Where have you been? What are you doing? What are you becoming? I'm just a Christian. Build up this life. Let there be a model, a dream, a goal, a pattern that you are aiming at. Here we have a family, man and woman coming together, a Christian brother, a Christian sister. When you come together, what is the goal? What is the pattern? What is the sketch and the drawing that the architect in heaven has given to you as a family? And he says, this is where you are going. And we just find those families, they just live from day to day. There is no pattern. We live from day to day and there is no model. We live from day to day and there is no goal. There is no dream. And I'm saying today, there must be a pattern. There must be a model. We must say this family will be like the family of Aquila and Priscilla. This family will be like the family of Ezekiah and Elizabeth. This family will be like Joseph and Mary. Let there be a pattern. And there you are walking towards that and walking towards that because there is a vision, there is a goal, and you are building towards a particular pattern. Then the church. Some people have the church and there's no pattern. We just go from day to day and week to week and program to program and we're saying, what kind of church are we raising up? Is it at the church in Ephesus? Let there be a pattern. A church, the church in Smyrna? Let there be a pattern. The church in Philadelphia? Let there be a pattern. Or you want the church of the Laodiceans? A pattern. The church of Thessalonica? You have this church in front of you and you say, this is the model and we're building towards this. Before we build, there is a pattern. Before we build, there is the architect's drawing. And then we're looking at that every time. And as the people are making construction and all that, the foreman is making this and that. We're checking up, we're supervising. How do I get near and get close to the pattern I'm building to us? That's the reason why we're here. And that's the reason we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 3. I'm not there yet, but we're looking at Romans chapter 15 verse 20. In Romans chapter 15 verse 20, it says, And the God, chapter 15 verse 20, Chapter 15, verse 20. Yea, so have I tried to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. The preaching of the gospel, the work of God, is building, building, building. Will be an habitation for God. That is a place where God will come and say, I love this, I appreciate it. This is my house. I'm going to dwell here. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 21, verse 22. Ephesians 
chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord. You see that? That is to bring all the members together, the ministers together, and the officers together. Everybody will build them up into a united building, into a united temple, into a compact temple. And God is saying, that is my habitation. I can live there. Look at verse 22. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. An habitation of God through the Spirit. And then uh, there are times that you, all, all you need is also fortify. That means to strengthen. Let me come back to Nehemiah chapter 3. And let's search, let's look for that word, the word fortify. It means to strengthen. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 3 verse, verse 8. Nehemiah chapter 3. We're looking at verse 8. What other people are building? Other people, they're, they're erecting something, they're repairing the foundation, or they're restoring the beauty and the strength of those walls. Some other people, they just fortify. We're looking at chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. In chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Next unto him repaired Uziel, the son of Ahiah. And then it says, Of the gold, of the goldsmiths. Next unto him also repaired Ananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries. And they, tell me that, tell me out aloud, they fortified Jerusalem unto the broad world. Fortified, that means they striving. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 3. So Revelation chapter 3, and we're looking at verses 3. 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 3. Why don't you start from verse 1? And unto the angel of the church of inside his right. These things says, the, says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen, fortify, strengthen, fortify the same thing, and strengthen those things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. And the Lord is saying that he wants perfection in his perfection. And he wants us to so build that the wall will be fortified, the work will be fortified, the church will be strengthened, and the work of the Lord will prosper, and then God will be happy, and will say, that is my habitation. And that habitation, the Lord will rejoice to dwell in that habitation in Jesus' name. Don't sleep on me, give me a good amen. amen. I'm going to divide the message of three parts. The message itself, as you look at this, we're talking about commitment to the restoration of lost glory. Lost glory. Because the walls were broken down. Lost glory. The gates were born to fire. Lost glory. And because all the death and all the defilement, the robbers just came and things were not clear. The gates were not open. The gates were not clear. And we need to restore the glory of this uh, temple and of this uh, city. That's why I'm saying we're committed. We're giving ourselves to the restoration of lost glory. Number one, number one is God-given responsibility demanding the saints consecration God-given responsibility and it demands the saints consecration number two now number two is the glorious restoration through sustained concentration concentration that means you pay attention to it that means to focus on it that means to concentrate on it we're talking about the glorious restoration that comes through sustained concentration. Number three, in number three we have great revelation for our solemn consideration. There are some things you find in this chapter and they are great revelations and therefore our solemn consideration. I pray that as you consider all these things, the Lord will give you wisdom, I will give you understanding, I will give you sustained ministry in Jesus' name. Point number one now, God gave me responsibility demanding the saints consecration. We're coming to Nehemiah chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 1. From verse 1 it says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up and with his brethren, the priest, and they built the ship gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. And even unto the tower of 
Mir, the sanctified gate unto the tower of Ananiel. And then it goes on in verse 2, you find the word buildage. And then in verse 2, latter part of verse 2, buildage. And then in verse 3, you find the fish gauge. And what did they do? They built it. That word is there again. And then they laid the beams. And then you come to verse 4. Next unto them, repaired. They began to use the word repaired down because it was still there. But it crumbled. It crumbled down. So they repaired. And then you come to verse 5. Next unto them, they take quartz. Repaired. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Uh, you find something here that uh, it's like they had the leaders and the laity. The laity, they just went on the fire. God was burning within them. And they wanted to restore and rebuild. And because of that, the laity, that's the ordinary people, the common people, the members of that uh, of the tribe, of the Teokrat, they, they, just, they just built. But the nobles, the leaders, they, did, they didn't care for the building of those gates and those walls, you know, it's very much commendable that these people did not say, our leaders are not doing anything, so why should we do anything? Our leaders are not concentrating on it. What should we, why should we bother ourselves? But they said, this is the work for everyone. I love the Lord. I love his work. Therefore, whether my leaders are up and doing or not, I'm just going to get something done. That's the attitude of these people. I pray that God will give us that had you in Jesus' name. Now, if the members where the leaders are not up and doing, if those members, they are up and running, and they are repairing, and they are building, and they are getting involved with the work of the Lord, how much more when the leaders are fervent, when the leaders are zealous, when the leaders are hardworking, and I say that those are the leaders the Lord has given us in this church, and we don't have any excuse. What I'm saying is, if the members of that tribe where the nobles and the leaders are not up and doing, yet those members said we're going to do something. How about in our case, you find our leaders in the forefront. You find our leaders, their hands are there, their heart is there, their mind is there. In our own church here, when our leaders call meetings and they say we're going to evangelize, we'll find our leaders there. And when they say we're coming to build a local church, we'll find our leaders there. And if these people could be up and doing when their leaders were not doing anything, how much more those of us who are here, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. I said we'll do it in Jesus' name. These people, they were really active in the work of the Lord. Just like you are, I'm just saying the good thing God has started in you will continue until you see him face to face in Jesus' name. You come to, you come to verse 6, you find the word repaired. You come to verse 7, you are going to find the same thing, the first line there. Next unto them repaired, male tire. And then they just went on and on. They fortified in verse 8. Then in verse, in verse 9, look at verse 9. We're looking at verse 9. And next unto them repaired. The fire, the son of her, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. Uh, can you think about that? That you have the whole of Jerusalem, and they didn't commit that to just one person. They divided even Jerusalem into two and say, You take one part and you take another part. You know, sometimes in our own uh, church over here, we divide, we we'll say, We have this region, we have this region, we have this region. We we'll say that, for example, this uh, community is about three million people, divide that into three regions. And we we'll thank God that our church, there's no complaint. But what if we we'll say, even in the city, one city, like you know, in one state, you have the city there is up to five million. And we say that because even though it's one single city, we're going to divide this into two. And some people will say, But why is one city? Why are they dividing number one? Look at Nehemiah that they divided Jerusalem into two and this to take half, and the other one to take another half, not only that, number two. There are some countries, even in our, in our continent of Africa. They're just about one million in population. And when you have a, a single city with three million in population, that's about three nations of that size together. And so when we divide Jerusalem or your city or your whatever it is, or your local government or your whatever it is, into two, and we say, you take one and you take the other, understand the population you still have to evangelize in some cases is still more than a whole nation, a whole country in some of the parts of our continent. So that's why we do that. 
And I pray that as we do this, there will be no complaint again in our midst in Jesus' name. I read in verse 9, and you see the ruler of half part of Jerusalem. Look at the other half in verse 12. And next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. He and his daughters the daughters even got involved the women even got involved in repairing these gates and repairing these walls and i pray that as these women they were up and running and doing a women too the women folk they'll be up and running in jesus name now i've read to you all this you know what i find out these people were committed people they were people that were ready to build the mage through their word. That is, they had said, we well, will rise up and build. And what they said they were going to do, they actually did. And I find that sometimes there are people that they come like this and after coming, then you find out that all the things they promised the Lord they will do. After two days, we don't find them. After one week, we don't find them. But these people, they make good their word. Let me show you what they had said earlier in uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 18. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, what did they say? Let us rise up and build. And they said, let us rise up and build. They said that at the conclusion of chapter 2. As we find them in chapter 3, everything they said they were going to do, they began to do. I'm going to ask you a question now. All the promises you have made to the Lord since you were born again, all the commitment you made to the Lord when you were born again, all the consecration that you made to the Lord when you were born again, oh Lord, I will do this. Oh Lord, I will do this. Oh Lord, I will do this. Where? are we today where are you today what have you done what have you done what have you given of all the things you promised lord i'm going to do this not only that when you were sick and then it appeared are you going to live you were hanging between life and death and you said lord i realize how careless i've been i realize how idle i've been i realize how unproductive i've been if you get me out of this sick bed, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. All those things you opened your mouth and you said, where is it today? What are you doing today? As these people said in chapter 2, let us rise up and build in chapter 3. They rose up and they began to build. All the time, you know, remember, you're under discipline. And then, you know, we went for workers a meeting, you are not there. You we went for workers retreat, you are not there. And then the Congress came, you were not able to come because of this thing that happened. And then you said, Oh Lord, I feel miserable. The joy of my life has been taken away. If you get me off this situation from this discipline and they restore me. Oh Lord, all that have not been able to do during this time of discipline. Once I'm restored, oh Lord, here am I, my life, my will, everything, I surrender to you. I'm going to serve you like I never did before. And then after that workers retreat, the leadership called you, and then you are restored. And since you are restored, where is it now? All the promises were made. The people said, let us rise up and build. And the very next chapter, they rose up and they started building. I pray that you will build in Jesus' name. I said you will build in Jesus' name. I'm asking, I'm reading from Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. And we're going to see the attitude we ought to have. The attitude we ought to have. You open your mouth to the Lord. And you say, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. As the people promise the Lord, you also, you promise the Lord. I'm looking at you from Judges chapter 11 verse 35. And it came to pass when he saw her, that he wrenched his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. Thou art, thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Jephthah said, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. The cost was high, but he said, I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot go back. We're going to read that together, just that part. I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot go back once you go. That's great. Do better now. 
wonderful from the death of your heart with consecration I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. And that's the beauty of what we see among these people. They said, well, rise up and build. And they rose up and they began to build. Make good the promises we have given unto the Lord. I'm reading from Psalm 15. Reading from Psalm 15. I read from verse 1. The people that will dwell in the holy city, in the holy place in New Jerusalem. The people that will be in the very presence of God in all eternity. Here we are. It says, Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? And who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart, speaketh the truth in his heart, speaketh the truth in his heart. That's, that's the person that it's not that you know he has uh, you know uh, 100 naira and then when he's uh, asking, Oh Lord, I'm going to give you this, he says, And this is uh, the 10 naira I have, this is all the 10 naira I have. God, can you have this? And he has 100. And the Lord is saying, the one that speaketh the truth in his heart, he has a million naira. And then you see, you know, we're saying now we're going to build uh, this, our local church here. And uh, those who have this, and then he says, so I wish I had something to give. But, you know, I have uh, this uh, 1,000 naira here, and he has a million. But he speaks the truth in his heart. I pray that God will make us truthful people in Jesus' name. And those are the people going to heaven. He says in verse 3, He that biteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt, and, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that swear to his own heart and changeth not. He that swear to his own heart and changeth not. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. We are going to read that together. Won't you go? Once again. Say it with conviction. Oh, the people that will not say, oh Lord, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have told you I'm giving my time to you. I shouldn't have told you I'm giving my tithes and offering to you. I shouldn't have told you I'm going to be a real worker, dynamic and fiery. I shouldn't have told you I'm going to be like Nehemiah. He that swear to his own heart and changes not. Then it says, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth this thing shall never be moved. That's what the Lord is calling us to, that you will know the calling the Lord is giving you. And as the Lord gives you this calling, you say, oh Lord, with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, I promise you I'm going to serve you. And then you will serve the Lord. You will serve him in Jesus' name. I said you will serve him in Jesus' name. Whatever comes out of your mouth, you are saying, Oh Lord, here am I. I really want to serve you. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. When thou vowest a vow, that's a vow. Let us rise up and build. We're going to rise up and build. This work, I'm not going to be idle anymore, indolent anymore, lazy anymore. I'm going to sink everything. I've got all my energy into the work of the Lord. And this work will prosper in my hand. And it says, when thou vows a vow unto God, defy not, delay not to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Pay that which thou hast vowed. And sometimes, you know what makes people not to pay their vow like that, I'm going to walk for God, I'm going to serve God, is because the part of the wall, they are called on to repair. You repair this part, and you repair this part, and you repair this part. They're looking at the part of the wall they're repairing, and they say this one has more dirt, this one has more rubbles, and this one has more difficulty and challenges. How is it they gave this to me, and they're giving this to such and such? But you have opened your mouth to the Lord, let us rise up and build and you didn't give condition to the Lord at that time and this is not the time to be giving conditions now if it is this I will if it is not this I want if it is this I, I'll go at it if it's not this I, I'm going to withdraw no you give yourself fully to the Lord I pray that you have on your life in Jesus name would you look, uh, look at this man Jonah chapter 2 Jonah chapter 2 Jonah chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 8 
Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. It says in Jonah chapter 2 verse 8, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. What happened is that Jonah was a prophet and he had given the vow and the commitment of a prophet. Oh Lord, I'll declare your word. Send me anywhere. Send me, Lord. Oh Lord, send me. And the Lord said, Jonah, go to Nineveh, that big city, great city, and go declare unto them the word I have commanded. And then he said, Nineveh of all places, I want them to perish. I want him to die. How is it the Lord is sending me to Nineveh? And then he backed out from what he had said because he did not like that assignment. If it's another place, I will go. But this one, I don't think I want to go to this one. That's why the judgment of God came. You know the story, how the storm came, how they threw him into the river, how the whale swallowed him up. It was in the way he now began. He now remembered what's happening to me is because I forsook my vow. That's why he now said in that verse 9, I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Immediately he said, I'm going to do what I told the Lord I was going to do. Look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto, unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Next verse, chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The second time saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. The preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went. He arose and went. You will arise and you will go. I said you arise and you will go. Because that's the calling of the Lord. And that calling of the Lord you will not fail in Jesus name. Come back to Nehemiah chapter 3. There's a Lord we're going to look at here. Nehemiah chapter 3. As God's the faithful remnant united to build and restore the past glory of the city of the great king, they have led some instructions for us, builders and restorers today. We're restorers, we're repairers, we're builders. And they have left some instruction for us. And I'm going to give you some videos, a summary now of that part I've read to you of the, of the whole chapter, chapter 3. Number one, devotion to the Lord. Devotion to the Lord. They said, we're going to do this for the Lord. And as you read the chapter 3, you see, that although enemies came, opposition came, everything came against them, they said, this is for the Lord. And we we'll see their devotion to the Lord. The whole work was done. With single minded, with singleness of heart, seeking only the glory of God and not seeking great things for themselves. Have you seen that, uh, you know, as they built the wall, they did uh, put, uh, you know, a cyborg there repaired by so and so. They allowed Nehemiah to do that, to do the recording. They didn't say, I'm the one that gave this, I'm the one that gave this, you know, putting their names there. I'm the one that did this one. I want my name on that wall. I want my name in that gate. I want some. This is for the glory of God. What you do will be for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Number one, devotion to the Lord. Number two, decision and directives by leadership. Decision and directives by leadership. It wasn't, you know, everybody directing everything. Everybody saying, you stand up. This one is saying, stand up. That one is saying, sit down. This one is saying, move forward. That one is saying, come back. This one is saying, they put this one there. This one is saying, remove that one. No, there was leadership. And that's why there was good coordination among these people that walked along with Nehemiah. D decision and directives. Decision and directives by the leadership. That's the beauty and the strength in our church that we have leadership in our church. Uh, you know, from the top to the bottom, from the general superintendent to the state overseers, and whatever we say, say to ourselves, this is what to do. There's decision, there's directives from the leadership, and then from the state overseer to the region overseers, and whatever the state overseer is saying, and he's saying, this is the way to go, that's the way to go, we all follow. And from the region overseers to the local government pastor, district pastors, and they give that direction, and everybody is saying, yes, that's how they did it in the Himalayas day. That's how we're going 
going to do it and we come to the local church we have a sectional leader there and that sectional leader is telling all the people working under his leadership this is what to do and everyone say yes that's what we are going to do it is that organization and it is that submission it is that obedience and loyalty and faithfulness that makes the work strong number two then decision and directives by the leadership number three division of labor have you seen this that you know from this bus this one's building that bus another one is building this and another bus this one is building that they divided everything the the division of labor the priests and the levites and the rulers and the merchants and the tradesmen and the families all took their turn and their share in this glorious work where the work of the Lord is concerned, it is only fitting that there should be unity of spirit and division of labor as we find in this chapter. That's why you and they didn't, they didn't disturb you know, other people. They just concentrated on their own. They said, hey, you there, why are you building yours like that? Oh, they have their own leader. Their own leader will correct if anything goes wrong. And then you there, why is it you are sitting down now? Do you know what instruction their leader has given them in that section? The division of labor means that you concentrate on your part. I concentrate on my part and thank God there was this Nehemiah supervising everything to make sure that every bit of the work, every portion of the work follows according to pattern, according to standard. We are going to do it in Jesus' name. Number four, dedication to their Lord. Dedication to their Lord. They are not prognosing into this, prognosing into that, prognosing into that. They just stage of what they were supposed to do. You know, if uh, you know what you are to do is not very clear. If it's not well mapped out, if there is uh, no kind of uh, assignment that is well clearly defined, how do we know what to do? Everyone will just say, you know, do this. Why are you there? I thought I was to do that. Because there was no master plan and there was no very, there was no demarcation of duty and assignment to say this is what you do. In the case of Nehemiah, he just said, that's your part, that's your part, that's your part. And we find dedication to their Lord. Number five, we have demonstration of loyalty. Demonstration of loyalty. Those people are loyal. No argument in this chapter. No conflict in this chapter. No disagreement in this chapter. No fighting in this chapter. No pulling apart in this chapter. They just said, this is what to do and this is the pattern to follow. And that's what they did. Demonstration of loyalty number six is discernment by the leadership. Discernment by the leadership. There are some people that said, we want to be part of it too. We can do something too. And the leadership discerned that they were not having the right heart and the right attitude. Because of that, he said, no, you don't have any part in this. Look at chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 19. And where but went Sambalat the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite, and the Geshem, the Arabian, of the tribe of Arab, at each, they laughed us to scorn, and despised us, and said, What is the what is the sin that she do? Will ye rebel against the king? Therefore answered I them. And said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Those people wanted to take part in They said, no, you, you cannot do any, any part of this work because you must, have, you must be born again. You must be circumcised. You must be sanctified. There must be a change, a transformation. You must be part of us. How can a child of the devil come to build some people Christ? How can somebody in the kingdom of darkness take part in the work of the kingdom of light? It's not possible. He must be born again. He must be transformed. He must be a changed individual before he can have part in this. Number seven is the devotion of the leader. You see Nehemiah. Nehemiah was part of it. The soul of the whole undertaking. The planning, the motivating, the mobilizing, and the delegation, and the supervising, and the sustaining of the work. Everything depended on the great sacrificial service of Nehemiah, the leader. And I pray that as our leaders have been committed, they'll continue to be committed in Jesus' name. And even more commitment we're going to see from our leaders in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. Glorious restoration through sustained 
concentration, sustained concentration. Look at that word, sustain, sustain. You know, the people, their attention span is very small. They can concentrate for maybe five minutes. After five minutes, their minds begin to wander. And then they, they want to, they're just listless. They're restless. And you, some people cannot concentrate on one single assignment for a long period of time. They are building this now, and then they stop, and then they, not that they are lazy, they are hard working, and they, they appear that there is a lot of energy bottled in inside them, but they cannot stay on just one assignment and finish it through and just say, this is done. And that's why they will have a lot of what we call unfinished projects, unfinished projects. And it starts with small, small things in your life. First of all, number one is the unfinished day. You wake up in the morning and say, these are the things I'm going to do. And normally what you should do is to say A, B, and C. A, very important, very essential, must be done. I cannot be really B, very important, but if I don't get to it, I can do that tomorrow. And then C, I can do it. It's all right, but it's a non-essential. A, B, and C. And when you wake up in the morning, that, that's what to concentrate on. You say, this one is urgent and important. And then you concentrate on that. And it is when you finish the urgent and important, you then go to B, it's important, but it's not urgent. And then if you finish B, then you come to C, this one is not important, it's good, it's good, there's nothing bad, it's not a simple thing, it's good, but not important and not urgent. But people, they are modeled up. But you see these people, they said this is important as well as urgent. And we're going to get it done. And they concentrated on it until they feel they sustained, sustained concentration. And then you, you, if your day is unfinished day, and then in the night you say, what I said I was going to do. This A item, I never got to it. You know, I just started when I got to the office, I started reading newspapers. And from the newspapers, and then somebody came to my office, have you seen this? And then we started talking. And then after the talking, I, I looked at the mails and then this and that. And before and the day is now gone, the essential thing, the important thing, the urgent and the important, all that is so unfinished day. And then you say, I'm going to read a one book in a month. That's even too little, one book in a month, but at least you start with that. And then you pick up this book, you read introduction, read the you know, you read the preface, and then you start with chapter one. At maybe half chapter one, you close it, and then, oh, this other book I've been wanting to read it before. I about the other one, I'll get back to that later. Have you finished any book since you started reading? Apart from your, you know, your academic book, I mean, I'm talking about real spiritual books that will help you. Unfinished books, they are all there. And then, unfinished projects, decisions. We're going to do this, we're going to do this. Hey, Pastor, you announced the other time, this is what we're going to do. After about a two Sundays, the Pastor makes another announcement, the other one is abandoned, and then the unfinished projects. As we look at our lives, we want to come back and learn from this Nehemiah. What did he take permission from the king was going to do? He was going to build the walls that are broken down. He was going to build and repair the gates that are all destroyed with fire. And then he stayed there. There was reformation work to do at that wait. There was teaching work to do, let that wait. There's this one to let that wait. This one I told the king I was going to do, that he did. It was when he finished that and concluded that and perfected that, he went to another thing. That's what we're learning from Nehemiah here, that you will finish what you have started, you will finish in Jesus' name. Glorious restoration through sustained, sustained concentration. I'm looking at Judges, Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. You get tired, other people. People get tired too. And then you get disinterested along the way, in the middle of the way, other people get the same problem too. Judges chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 4. Judges chapter 8, we're looking at verse 4. And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him. Faith, yet, what? Pursuing them. Faith, Tired, weary, fatigued, yes, pursuing them. And that's the reason why they succeeded. And that's the reason we are going to succeed as well. Are uh, you going to sleep? Yeah. We'll succeed in Jesus' name. Yeah. 
difficulties will come, challenges will come, but it's not the difficulty. Uh, we're looking at the picture at the edge of the race. We're looking at the picture at the end of the building. And we're looking at the edifice we're setting up. We're looking at the wall strong and deep and high and thick we're setting up and we see the end from this point you say when everything is completed this is the way it will look like that's what is keeping us going you'll keep on going in jesus name the lord is not interested in those who start and they are not able to finish we're starting and we're going to finish we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter 20 verse 24 acts of the apostles chapter 20 verse 24 it says but none of these things move me None of these things move me. You know what? There are many people, they are easily moved. A little wind is blowing, they are moved. And you know, when you have a sheet of paper that doesn't have too much weight, you put that thing on the scale, and the index, the hand of the scale will not even move at all. Because the, the thing is so large. And because it's so light, any breeze or any wind that blows will blow it up. If things that are light and things that are minor are able to move you, that, you know, you are standing on this, you are so lightweight that whatever is happening is blowing you off from what you ought to do. But Paul the Apostle said, I am heavyweight. And it doesn't matter, the wind blowing, that will not move me. Persecutors rising up, that will not move me. And he said, all the slider and the journey, that will not move me. All the misinterpretation of what I say, the misinterpretation of my intention, all that will not move me. They have their liberty, they have freedom of speech to say whatever they want to say. I know that this is where I'm going and that is what I'm doing. That's why he said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Neither count I my life. When he says my life, what does that mean? My breathing in and breathing out. More than that, it means my health. It means my joy. It means my happiness. It means even my property. It means all that I possess. All that makes life what life is. All those things do not matter to me. There's one thing that matters to me. This work the Lord has given me to do. I've started and I'm going to finish. There's one thing that matters to you. I said there's one thing that matters to you. It is the work of the Lord has committed into your hand. There are some people they say, I want to take life easy so that I don't endanger my life and I don't die. You know, people who don't walk, they also die. People who even sleep all through their days and all through their time, they also die. Lazy people die. Have you seen lazy people living forever? I said, have you seen them? No, no, so don't walk. Idle people, they die. Lazy people, they die. In fact, indolence kills people more than work. Because, you know, when you are not working, you have the tendency to eat and eat and eat. And when you just eat and eat and eat like that, you dig your grave with your teeth. And so that's the reason why, get up and work. If you are going to die, die on active service. I said, die on active service. You know, we say, uh, the South Church to live there, you know, those people there, I don't know the kind of people they are. I don't want to endanger my life. Hey, get out. That's the place to go. And if whatever people are there, they'll not touch your life in Jesus' name. And that's why Paul, the apostle, on all this, none of these things move me, neither count I my life, my health, my joy, my treasure, my property, anything at all, dear unto myself, so that I might finish my cause with joy. He said, I've started, I'm going to finish. Anybody wanting to finish there? Amen. You will finish in Jesus' name. And then he say, he tells us here, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And that's what these people add, and that is what we are going to have. I come to point number three now. Great revelation for our solemn consideration. Great revelation. Great revelation for our solemn consideration. I'm coming to Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1. It says in verse 1, Then Elash, the high priest, rose up with, with his brethren, the priest, and they built it, the ship gate. They sanctified it, and set up the doors of each, even unto the tower of Mir. 
the sanctified age unto the tower of Ananiel. Oh, we find uh, one man here, and this man, he, he rose up, and he was number one to build. And he built the ship gate. You know why? Because he was a high priest, and he got all these other priests around him. And the reason why he did that at the ship gate is that the people will bring their sheep for sacrifice. And he, as one of the priests and the high priest, he will take that and sacrifice for them, for the cleansing, for atonement of their sins. And now he did this, and this was good. So far, so good. So far, so good. But uh, let's see. That's the beginning of Nehemiah. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 13 now. Nehemiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 4. Nehemiah chapter 13 from verse 4. And before this, Elisha, do you recognize him now? The priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Tobiah was an enemy, enemy of God, an adversary to the people of God, and he had this kind of secret association, secret attachment, secret networking with Tobiah. A person that was at the forefront of serving the Lord, of working for the Lord. And he had this a kind of association. And then it goes on in verse 5. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offering and the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of corn and new wine and oil which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. Nehemiah was not around. Nehemiah went back to the king because you know Nehemiah had given the king the date, the time. He said, I'll come back at this time. And so he went back temporarily. And before Nehemiah came back, we're told that Elashi had compromised. I pray you'll not compromise. You know, it's not just to start. It's not just to say, I concentrated on the work. I committed myself unto the work. The responsibility was given. That the chance was given. The opportunity he was given. He misused that opportunity. And that's why the Lord is telling us, there is a great revelation for a solemn consideration that you'll not be a person that will backslide and then you'll link up and join up with the enemies of God. Enemies of the work of the Lord. And here we are told, he even made a chamber somewhere for them to live, for him to live. He said, I came unto the king that's when he was absent. And after certain days obtained I leave of the king. He came back again in verse 7. And I came to Jerusalem. And understood of the evil that Elashib did for Tobiah. In preparing him a chamber in the courts of the Lord of the house of God. You see this? That this man that was serving God before. Now he had backsliding when the man of God, Nehemiah, when he went away for some time. Because of the absence of Nehemiah, he had gone into compromise. I pray that will not be you. Compromise will not be part of your life and part of your ministry and part of your family. In Jesus' name, watch over your wife. Don't allow your wife to bring compromise and syncretism, idol worship into the church. Watch over your husband so that your husband will not bring idolatry and all this candle burning and all these adultery practices into the watch over your children so they will not bring all these books and you know this territorial spirit and bush spirit and water spirit and this uh, high spirit, heaven spirit and low spirit. They will not bring it to our church in Jesus name. This relationship, he brought all this. I pray that what God has helped you to build, you will not destroy in Jesus' name. Look at verse 8. And he gripped me so. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chambers. And then I commanded and they cleansed the chambers. That's a real man of God. Thank God for Nehemiah and thank God for you. You'll be like Nehemiah in Jesus' name. Look at verse 28. Look at verse 28. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib. Eliashib began. Look at him. 
Look at him. You know, at the very end of Nehemiah, the man was no, we cannot reckon with him anymore. In chapter 3, it was in verse 1. He led the whole team. He said, look at my example. Look at my pattern. Here is what I'm doing for the glory of God. At the end, he didn't endure to the end. He didn't contend unto the end. He didn't hold on the standard unto the end. You will hold on to the standard to the end in Jesus' name. It says in verse 28, And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sambalat, the Horonite. Therefore, what did I do? Tell me out loud. Tell me again. I chased him from me. There's no Elashib in the house here. Men and women were going to do this. The same passion I have, you have that passion. The same commitment I have, you have that commitment. I will continue to the very end in Jesus' name. And say, so said, I chased him from me. I chased him from me. I will thank God. Deeper life, uh, pastors and deeper life, uh, group pastors and deeper life overseers. Anywhere we see compromise or compromise, we chase them away. We will not have, you know, it's my relative, it's coming from my village, it's of my tribe, it's of my, it's my sister-in-law, it's my this and that. Once they bring in sin and they bring in evil, we, we chase them from us and nobody is going to you know be criticizing us and look at uh, you know pastor so and so he chased that person away we join hands together and we chase reprobates and compromise us away from the church in jesus name and so that is what we find here that's why he might pray in verse 29 in verse 29 it says remember them oh my god because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priest of the priesthood and of the Levites. So we find all these uh, people here and we thank God for people like Nehemiah. Thank God for you as well that were honestly contending for the faith. Once delivered on sins, I was not going to look back in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. In Jude verse 3, I'm reading here from verse uh, chapter 1 verse 3. It says, uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that and exhort you that you should half-heartedly content, lazily content, sleepingly content. How do you content? Honestly content for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Honestly content for the faith which is once delivered, was once delivered unto the saints. Thank God I'm in a church like this. This is the kind of church that is preparing to get to heaven. And that's the only place I want to go because I'm not going to go to hell. How about you? How about you? Stay in a church like this. If you have been, you know, kind of befriending compromisers there, compromisers, compromisers there, don't you want to endure to the end? It's only the people that endure to the end that shall be saved. And I want you, I'm pleading, well, I'm praying for you, you will endure to the end in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 11. Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many, but they will not deceive you. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he and she that shall endure to the end, tell me, the same shall be saved. When the saints go marching in, you'll be there. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God will help you. That God will help you. You'll not die by the wayside. You'll not give up by the wayside. You will not compromise. You will chase all those compromisers. Chase them away from you. Pastor of a local church, chase those people away from the priesthood. Group pastors, chase them away from the priesthood. Don't allow them to pollute the priesthood, defile the priesthood. Let's stand firm. Standing together on the watch of the living God. Standing together on this unchanging word and it's like contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints bring all these things what lunch before the lord and say lord help me the gate of the house of the lord to be built get involved in it this is the lord's house and it's the gate of heaven get involved 
and the gate of Zion, get involved. The gate of the Lord, get involved. Build. The Lord will help you. Make all your talent or your skill or the earnestness within you. If compromise is setting in, pray and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Repent of that. And if your leaders have been asking you, and you've been denying, open up. Say, I'm sorry about that. I didn't tell you the whole truth before. But now I've repented. I've given my life fully to the Lord now. The Lord will accept you. Build up your life, your prayer life. Build up your life, your study life. Build up your life, your spiritual life. Build up your life, your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Build up your family. Have a model before you. Have a pattern before you. And make sure that you build according to that pattern. Shoot to you in the mount. There's a mount of transfiguration. And the Lord is showing us what pattern, what model, what example to build a family on. Family like Aquila and Priscilla that yields their necks to the work, addicted to the work. Like Zechariah and Elizabeth, committed, righteous. Even though they didn't have any child by that time, when the angel came to them, but they kept on working for the Lord, serving the Lord, with all sincerity, humility, and holiness, until the child came. Give yourself wholly, fully, completely, or reservedly to the Lord. Build up the ministry. Don't join to build Babylon. Don't join to build Babel. Build up the body of Christ. Fortify and strengthen the things that remain. Look at the work, your local church, any weak section there, discouraged section there, scattered section there, get in there and build. Look at every section and go build the ministry, the work. The people of God. I used to the organization in this chapter 3. Devotion to the Lord, Nehemiah, and all the other people working along with him. Devoted, committed. Devotion to the Lord. Decision and directives by leadership. The legs and the hands are not taking decision for the head. The mouths and the nose and the ears were not taking decision for the head. The head took decision and the members of the body followed. That's what they did. That's how they did it. That's how the work prospered in their hands. And the work is going to prosper in your heart. So do the right thing in the right way for the right reason for the right purpose for the glory of God leave those decisions and directives in the hands of the leadership division of labor and devotion to your Lord keep at it stick to it stick to your area don't disturb other people.
Don't destroy what others are doing. Don't confuse others. You don't finish yours. Concentrate on your own. Be dedicated to your Lord. And if you are in that place before, now you are moved on to go and do another thing. Concentrate on what you are doing now. Don't blackmail, insult, slander other people because that's what I should have been doing. The person has no right to be doing it now. Don't say that. Don't say that. Or you're acting superior to other people. Or you're feeling superior to other people. Why don't you have submission to leadership in the church? The leadership has directed that this is what you'll be doing. Concentrate on that. Don't go through life. Sad grumbling, complaining, pushing other people down. I should be doing that. That's not a right attitude. Demonstrate loyalty. Demonstrate loyalty. And let it be discernment. Or the, in the leadership. Those who profess to know him, but in works deny him. And to every good work and righteous practice, they reprobate. Chase them away from the work. Let them go and settle their lives. Children of Satan cannot win converts for the Savior. Those who are antichrist in nature, antichrist in spirit, antichrist in heart, they cannot build up the body of Christ. They have the spirit of the antichrist walking in them. Be discerning. And we as workers, we as ministers, we as leaders, let's show the good example. If you are telling members to pray, pray, pray. We who are leaders must pray. If we are telling members to be faithful in giving their tithes and offering. We who are leaders and workers must be faithful in paying our tithes and offering. If we are telling them to evangelize, we who are leaders and workers, ministers must also evangelize. Nehemiah showed the devotion of the leader. Show that. And you remember this, Elashi? Don't be like him. You remember? This man that started well and finished bad. Started in the right direction. They finished as a reprobate, finished as a backslider, finished as an apostate. Beware, lest that which happened to Elashi, because of his attachment to the enemies of God. He destroyed what he built on. Pray that God will help you so that this great revelation for a solemn consideration you'll consider. You'll not backslide, you'll not compromise. You will not deteriorate. 
watch your connections watch your associations watch your networking you started well pray that God will help you to finish well he that endures to the edge the same shall be saved she that endures to the edge the same shall be saved